Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Welcome to this Web Extra that you're finding on IPTV.org. We are continuing our discussion about constitutional law in Iowa. Joining us on our program for this extra is Mark Kendi. He holds the James Madison Chair in Constitutional Law at Drake University and is also the director of the Drake Constitutional Law Center. Also on the program tonight, Karen Thalaker is an attorney and also a lecturer in public law at Wartburg College. She's an attorney and an author of the New Lawyer's Handbook. To the two of you, welcome back to this extra discussion because, of course, we can continue to discuss <laughs> lots of things here. I want to get a little bit, uh, I want to start off with some of the historic natures and then we'll get into the way this played out. So let's talk about the historic uh, nature of Iowa and their cases. Karen, uh, what is it about Iowa and the way they've set the bar, they have not been alone when they've been setting some of these standards. That's exactly right. You know, when you look at what was going on in the mid-1800s, it wasn't just the Iowa Supreme Court that was ruling on the decisions. It was also the Iowa legislature that was supporting the decisions and even taking it a step further. I think in uh, the piece that you showed on the show about um, the Iowa legislature removing all impediments to interracial marriage, they did that you know, over 110 years before um, the Supreme Court did it in Loving versus Virginia, I believe in 1967, and our neighbor to the south in Missouri, they, they waited till 1967 to, to allow interracial marriage. And so the Iowa legis legislature has been out in the fro forefront on that. Um, another um, case to talk about is um, Bell Bab Mansfield of Mount Pleasant, who became the first bar certified female attorney right. um, in the United States. What happened with that is at the time that she became a bar certified attorney, it was the court system that allowed her to be admitted, even though the Iowa statute clearly said white male persons may be lawyers. And so they allowed her to be admitted anyway. And the legislature, instead of protesting, said, okay, let's go in and change the law. And not only will we allow women to practice, but we will also allow people of all races to practice. So the, the new law read all persons. And then a few years later, the United States Supreme Court actually ruled on that same um, issue, can a state uh, forbid a woman from practicing law? Mm -hmm. And the um, answer to that that the Supreme Court said was, yes, they can, because women are too delicate and too timid for the practice <laughs> of law. And so it left it up to the states to decide, and it took a long time. Um, Delaware was the final state. It was 1923 before they allowed women to be bar certified wow. attorneys. So when you look at what Iowa has done in the large scheme of things, it wasn't just the judiciary, it was the, the legislative branch and of course then the executive branch also supporting those decisions. Mark, why is it that Iowa is so far out in front on some things like this and has been front on things like this? You know, it's, it's fascinating and similar sort of story involving African Americans in Iowa. You know, Iowa allowed a, a black girl to go to school with white children. And part of the reason for that was that Iowa blacks had served and been involved in the Civil War. And after having served and being involved in the Civil War, when they came back, of course, it would have been a bit incongruous to then exactly. treat them unequally. So you have this history, and some scholars have done some work, and they said, and, and this is a little bit more complicated, but sort of interesting, some scholars have said there were enough blacks in Iowa to make a difference in terms of lobbying for this, but not too many to make those whites in the population in any way feel threatened. And so there are also these historical nuances in that particular case. It's a different one than what Karen was talking mm -hmm. about, but those kinds of historical nuances are sort of what ends up then affecting history. Is it that Iowa geographically just far enough west away from uh, what has gone on traditionally in the eastern part of the state where, or the country where uh, everything in this country had been formed and we were uh, far enough away and removed from those decisions? Is that part of it? Yeah, and I think, you know, Iowa's also, you might say, far enough away from the Deep South, but not completely divorced from the Deep South in the way that a Northeastern state would be. And so some of these issues happen to have arisen here, and then if you have groups of people, whether in the legislature or in the case of this woman uh, student who got into school, her father was known for being very active in terms of lobbying for civil rights, and but did so in a way that apparently was successful in not making the majority feel threatened and if you have that kind of situation happen then you can have historical change and now we're having historical change in what's going on I'll get to that in a moment but I want to talk about uh, the way Iowa selects judges uh, for the Supreme Court how is that are they set by regions are they set just appointments how is it that Iowa picks 
who is on and who picks who well, gets on the Supreme Court. You know, one of the other areas that Iowa has really led the rest of the nation is in what we call the merit selection of judges. That if you've ever been to Texas or Nevada, you see big billboards where judges are running for office. I, I remember visiting my sister in Las Vegas and seeing a person running for a judicial position with a sleeveless shirt riding a motorcycle, soliciting contributions for his political campaign. In Iowa, it doesn't work that way. What happens is um, we had amended the Constitution to allow for this merit selection in 1962. Um, judges um, apply for the positions. A committee made up of um, lay people and lawyers chooses the finalists, and then those finalists go to the governor, who then um, chooses the actual person who gets the job. And can they stay as long as they want? They have a retention election every six years, which means um, the public gets to vote yes or no, whether they get to be retained or not. But the judges can't campaign. Um, they, again, are not soliciting or accepting political contributions. Uh, people, Some people don't realize just how far removed from the political process our judges are. Of course, they can still vote. You know, they have a constitutional right to vote. But judges in Iowa don't even attend the Iowa precinct caucuses because they don't want their neighbors seeing mm -hmm. what their preference is for a candidate. That is how fiercely they guard their independence. And so for people you know, who want to say that the judges in Iowa anyway are activists, I don't think that they necessarily understand they are the opposite of activists, that they, they aren't beholden to any interest group or to any political party. They are removed from that process so that they can maintain their independence and then the people of Iowa can continue to have confidence in their rulings. And, and if I could add, I, I spent some time in Michigan and the typical judicial election in Michigan would often involve a campaign commercial in which someone seeking votes would say, this is a individual who would never simply be limited by those technicalities of the Constitution <laughs> when it comes to issues of criminal law. They wouldn't let that get in the way of making the right decision. So in Iowa, we don't have that. We do have this uh, respect for law. We don't have the process nearly as politicized. And one consequence is within the last couple of years, the Michigan Supreme Court has literally been at civil war with each other. Mm -hmm. They have literally been fighting publicly. And I'm not saying that, you know, merit selection guarantees no problems, but it does seem to avoid the uh, politicization. Almost kind of makes you puff your chest out a little bit and go, Iowa, again, has yeah. done it right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, let's, we don't have to say if Iowa did it right or not. The justices spoke seven to nothing. It was a unanimous decision. What, what did that message send when we talk about same-sex marriage when that was unanimous? I think, you know, when courts do things like that, you know, they're trying to, in a sense, transcend the ordinary boundaries of court decisions in some ways. I'm not saying that those people who uh, might be conservative on the court versus those who are liberal gave up their principles, but typically there is a, an aspect in which the justices have to really talk to each other, engage in dialogue, come together and say this is an important case and it's important uh, regardless of what a political party is. And then again when you read the decision you see how well crafted it was they put the work in to do that. So I think it's a statement of them seeing the importance of this case and taking it very seriously. Do you concur? I do. And and even though um, Justice Katie's name appears on the opinion and the others join, you better believe that that opinion went around the Supreme Court building many, many, many times. So it, the judges do work in a very collaborative way. Mm -hmm. And there is some give and take about what ended up in that opinion, I'm sure. And the end result... Um, was, again, dis agree or disagree, a really well-written opinion. When you watched the discussion and the debate of presenting the case in front of the Supreme Court, when you mm -hmm. watched it, did you anticipate some of the language that would appear in the decision uh, that came from the questions that they were asked? I mean, I, I know you've probably read and studied and seen things like that before, but did some of the things pop out in the questions they were asking, or was it just, uh, I'm going to ask this, but I'm going to completely come back over here when I issue my decision? I would say judges have just kind of their own strategies for how they do that. I think generally when a case that is that important comes before a place like the Iowa Supreme Court, they are looking at that case with an open mind. And they've got questions for both sides of that case. They truly have not made up their mind. Mm -hmm. And so they want to ask you tough questions and see what your response is. That's their chance to ask you about your case. 
And, and Mark, you were saying that uh, some of the students you had this semester in the winter term, we're not even really studying this issue, but clearly it came up. What was it that they were talking about? Let's just talk about when they made the initial uh, discussion back in December uh, presentation to the court. What were the students asking about then? Well, th at that time, they were curious as to, you know, what kind of predictions could be made. And I always worry about making predictions in this kind of an area. So I tried to hesitate to make predictions. I, I will say that I think there was some thought among students that same-sex unions might be a compromise that the court would come up with. So that if they didn't want to endorse gay marriage, but they wanted to vindicate the principle of equality, that one way to kind of do that was to develop what, what sometimes is described in other states as same-sex unions. I wouldn't say that my class uh, authoritatively came down and predicted that. And so I think, though, that was something they thought was a possibility. And one of the things that made this opinion a bit of a surprise was not only was it unanimous, but the same-sex union issue was pretty much quickly dismissed as this is a second-class citizenship right. arrangement. We need to have marriage, or otherwise we're still reducing in the individuals to second-class citizens. There was no dipping of the toe. This was a full-on cannonball into the pool. That's exactly right. I had, I had one student who talked to me about, um, they, had, they had watched the, the video of the, of the arguments and mm -hmm. had wondered about the argument on behalf of the county that marriage was for the the purpose of having children. And so we had just kind of a long discussion about, you know, what is the purpose of marriage? And, and you know, can 80-year-olds get married because they can't have kids? You know, people who don't want to have kids. So and that were, was part of the argument yeah, that was made that day. That it was. And so not only were they interested in the outcome, you know, yes or no, are we going to have this or not? They were also, I think, surprisingly interested and in tune to the arguments that both sides were making. Hmm. What about the decision uh, when it came back, when the verdict came? I, I call it a verdict, but I mean, that's not the decision uh, that the Supreme Court. What about uh, when you go to class, uh, what were they talking about then when it came back? How was the, the, that discussion with the students? I think the students, my students were surprised yeah. about the decision and that it was seven to zero. Same with your students? Yeah, and I think they were surprised partly because within the last 10 or 15 years, the court's decisions on equal protection cases have been uh, somewhat... Uh, not always predictable. And the standard that the court had developed in these equality cases had not been 100% clear. And so for them to issue this sort of ringing endorsement mm -hmm. of a principle in a case of this importance, I think, was unique. They did have the history, going back to the 19th century, of an earlier past in which civil rights were vindicated. But within the last 15 years, the court's been kind of complicated. And this decision is well written, but it's pretty darn clear. Hmm. I think, Final thoughts. Well, I, was, I think my students were also surprised at the amount of national attention that the case got, that they were, um, they were surprised at how closely uh, people in other states were watching the decision. Very good. Final thoughts? I think one thing people don't realize is that although the result may not appear na narrow, the reasoning the court used was actually quite narrow. They could have decided this case on whether there's a right to privacy, mm -hmm. something called substantive due process, et cetera. They actually decided it relatively narrowly on whether there's discrimination. So when people yell and talk and disagree about it, we shouldn't forget that not only is the court not political here, but they wrote actually a decision which in many ways is quite narrowly reasoned. Hmm. And that's good. That's good, and that's good for our discussion at this point. That's Mark Kendi. He holds the James Madison Chair in Constitutional Law at Drake University and is also the director of the Drake Constitutional Law Center. And on the opposite side of the table, uh, for this discussion anyway, Karen <laughs> Thaliker, an attorney and lecturer in public law at Wardenburg College, attorney and an author of the New Lawyer's Handbook. To the two of you, thank you so very much for this extended discussion here on Iowa Public Television on IPTV.org. Thank you very much for watching.